Good. All right, let's again. This morning. Every day. Oh, oh the fire. Fuel on the shell. fire. I'm glad I'm across the street. Yeah, you're putting shell in there. All right, let's. You want <laughs> he wants to pray. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. All right. Lord, thank you for today and for every day that you give us. Uh, we pray that we would make the most of our days. Uh, we pray that uh, our lives would be characterized by the people in the Bible that uh, followed you and did right and were open to uh, your leadership. In Jesus' name, amen. So someone that I know was talking about like no one there. <laughs> Someone that I know is talking about uh, a story where they were in a tornado. And I don't know if you've ever been in a tornado, but I have not. And so I kind of wondered, like, you yeah, know. Yeah, it was a whirlwind tour. Thank you. <laughs> um, I kind of wondered, you know, what it was like and what the experience was. And so... The way he told it was he was in a restaurant. He was younger, probably in his early teens, and uh, he was eating food, and then someone ran in to the, to the restaurant and yelled out, there's a tornado coming, and it's, in, it's almost in the parking lot. And he said all he really saw was like just some dark, uh, dark darkness in the window, and then they all got under the table, and windows broke in, and everything kind of just went haywire and everybody was on the ground and then it was a few seconds it was gone and so you know he never really saw the actual tornado and um, but to hear that experience it kind of helped me see what was it like to be in the tornado and what would it be like and what happens and so forth and so and that's kind of a little bit similar to what it's like when God um, plans to replace leadership in the scriptures. When, when the people that are leading his people don't do what they should, he has to replace them. And so we see that in, in Mark chapter 12. And in Mark chapter 12, what we've been coming through is just before this, Jesus came into Jerusalem on, on a donkey's colt. And he came in very humble, according to the scripture, in Zechariah 8.8. 8. And he's coming in on an animal that had never been ridden. And this animal was significant because it fulfilled that prophecy that was talking about in Zechariah. But Jesus gave orders to his disciples and he told them to Go find this colt, and if someone asks you about it, just tell them the Lord has need of it. And exactly as he told them, it happened, and they told them the Lord has need of it, and the person let them let him take the animal. And so as he's coming into the to Jerusalem, he's passing by two cities, and he, as he gets closer, the people are are in front of him and behind him, chanting Hosanna, which means save Lord blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David Hosanna in the highest and they're putting leafy branches down in front of him and Jesus comes into the temple and it, it's late at that point and from just from what I've heard and read is that Jesus comes into the temple and when a king comes into the to his his city, he should be welcomed by the leadership there. And what happens is he's not welcomed by the leadership. In fact, he gets there and there's no one there. And what he does is, even the people that were in front of him and behind him seem to be gone. And it says, Jesus entered the temple, entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. And after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve since it was already late. So Jesus comes into his own city He's the king, and into the temple area, and there's no one there, no one leading him, no leaders to welcome him. And he looks around and he doesn't even stay there. 
he actually goes back to a different city to stay. And so then he sees a fig tree and he curses it because it doesn't have any fruit. But the scripture says that it was not the season for figs. Well, if you do a little research, you'll see that the fig tree should put out a little bit of a flower before it's time to bear the fruit. And if it doesn't do that, it probably means that it's not going to have any fruit. And so Jesus curses the fig tree and says, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And what happens is the fig tree withers and dies. And probably there's symbolism there to show that since Israel had significance in the Old Testament of being like a, like a fig tree, um, Jesus is saying that I found really no fruit in, in, my, in my own people, in my city. And it's nearing being cursed. And so as you get to the point of the parable um, of the vine growers, we see what it's like when God is led to replace the spiritual leadership of his people. And the first thing we see is that the leaders had a promising start because God did his part. The leaders had a promising beginning because of the, the building that God built them into. And it says here, Jesus began to speak to them in parables. This is 12 verse 1. A man planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a vat under the wine press and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers. And he went on a journey. And that's a lot of stuff packed into one verse. But it's a, it's a reference to an Old Testament scripture that shows that another symbol of Israel was that they were a vine. And, G, and God is said here to... He represents the man in this parable. And he planted a vineyard. He carefully tilled the ground and, and planted a vineyard there to grow. He even put a wall around it. And then he dug a, a big open area underneath it so that when people um, threshed the grapes, the, the wine, the juice would flow underneath and be u- useful. And he even built a tower to, to serve as a sentry or protect it. And then he rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. Now, in this scripture, we see that God created the vineyard. He created his people Israel. He brought them out of Egypt. He redeemed them from slavery miraculously and showed them a new way of covenanting with him and being protected and led by him and the prosperity that would be there for them if they obeyed him. He protected them, protected them from enemies, from surrounding people. He prepared them to bear more fruit and he watched over them. And so that's the imagery we get here. And then in this case, Jesus adds the fact that he rented this out to vine growers and then he went on a journey. So he gives he gives the people of Israel, his people, into the hands of the leaders. Now the leaders are not the owners, but they sort of get this mentality where they want to be the owners and take over. And so God did his part in planting Israel and causing it to grow and protecting it. And that's a promising start. It's a good start because God laid the foundation. And I don't know about you, but I remember I was trying to think of something that started out good and I thought of Blockbuster Video. Everybody used to go to Blockbuster Video in the 90s and there were, there were a, a lot of them you know, on, on multiple corners of the street and you'd go there and you'd pay $3.99 or whatever it was and you get your video, and there was all kinds of videos, and you could walk around, and you had to have a card, and they had a really good business for a while, billions of dollars. And then, I don't know what happened, but I think in relation to the online technology, technology the online advancements, Netflix and Redbox, um, they just didn't take those, take advantage of those avenues and now I think they're going bankrupt, or they did, and 
And so that was a promising beginning and, and the end didn't go too well. And so that's sometimes how things are. And you know, there's, things, there's ways we can guard against that. You know, we, we can look at the things that cultivated our beginning and we can try to keep those in our lives, whether it's just you know, lengthy times in prayer with God or um, just going to an extra service at church or Bible study, just different things that we can do, checking our heart, praying, and so God did His part for His people. And then, but since we're looking at this pattern, this scenario moved to an increasing rejection of God's pleas for for fruit and righteousness. They it started good, but then the second thing that happened was the people that He sent to the vine growers met rejection, and God was coming to get His fruit. His, his righteousness, His harvest, and His people were cast away. It says in verse 2 through 5, At the harvest time, He sent a slave to the vine growers in order to receive some of the produce of the vineyard from the vine growers. And this was common when you rented out your vineyard. You would seek and come and get some of the, the produce and you would take some of it and then you'd leave some for the vine growers. And, and there's different ways that um, that happens and it's similar today there's sharecropping and so forth and so he sent a slave and they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed again he sent them another slave and they wounded him in the head which means they repeatedly beat him in the head and they treated him shamefully he sent another and that one they killed and so with many others, beating some and killing others. Now this, is, this imagery is a reflection upon the prophets that God had sent to Israel. And I did a little looking up, and I found a few of them that were mistreated. And this is, this, here's a list that I got. Zechariah, he was a prophet. He was killed by Joash. And his blood was sprinkled on the altar altar horns. Habakkuk was stoned in Jerusalem. Jeremiah was stoned in Egypt, um, buried eventually by in Egypt by Pharaoh. Isaiah was killed by Manasseh by being sawn by be, taking a wooden saw and cutting him in half. And Elijah was not killed, but he was repeatedly sought out to be killed by Jezebel. And so that represents how the prophets were treated by their people, especially the leadership. Uh, they were mistreated, they were beaten, they were killed, they were rejected. And that is the way God and Jesus in this case characterizes their uh, treatment of God's pleas for righteousness to come out and the idea I think in this scripture is that God was patient and he waited around and he repeatedly tried to cultivate and encourage fruit to come forth from his people and it was met with rejection centuries and generations God reached out to Israel. And I, re I was reading a little bit about that, and, and that was the key that I found in that, that, that when I was reading, that he was repeatedly patient with them. And this is over hundreds of years, more than that. But there's another thing. It moves from starting out good to rejecting the prophets that God sends, the messengers, it moves to the rejectors trying to take over God's property or God's building or God's people. The rejectors try to take over. Verse 6 says, He had one more to send, a beloved son. And he sent him last of all to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those vine growers said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. They took him and killed him 
and threw him out of the vineyard. So God really saved the best for last. He saved his only son. And when Jesus is telling this parable, he hadn't been killed yet. And so he's speaking prophetically as he had already done by saying the Son of Man is going to be delivered up to the chief priests and scribes and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him and three days later he will rise again. His own people, his own leadership, and Jesus narrows in on the leadership here, would turn Jesus over to the Gentiles. And in the story, in the parable, it's that they wanted to take over the vineyard for themselves, which seems pretty foolish. And some people would say it might seem foolish. Why did God send His Son if if they treated the prophets this way? But I think it goes to show that there's something more hanging over this parable, as we will soon see. Now Jesus was killed, and in the story, the Son was killed and they threw Him out of the vineyard. Once again, Jesus is saying, I, was, I will be killed, but the idea was that Jesus was not even killed in his city. He was killed outside the city. So, this is the tragedy. The tragedy is that the vine growers are people who hold on to their self-interest, even to the cost of their own death. And that's tragic in our... In our um, culture, we see people that would just hold on to things that will, they won't give them a secure grip. They will not come to Christ. They will not turn away from evil and from sin or from maybe they're not even people that live horrendous lives. They just won't like put their faith in Christ. They won't repent. They'll hold on. And one thing I was reading that how quickly the, the man who planted the vineyard turned from patience to judgment. That's how quickly this story turns. Now Jesus throws out a question. He says, "What will the owner do? What will the owner of the vineyard do?" And it says, "He will come and destroy the vine growers and will give the vineyard to others." Now, the thing that was hanging over our head, why would God keep sending people and send His Son if He knew that they were going to keep rejecting Him? Because of verse 10, it says, Have you not read even this scripture, the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So, what we see is that God had a plan to use that rejection to bring about a whole new movement, a whole new building, not the temple anymore, a whole new building for other people to take leadership over. Now, the, the, the leaders who Jesus is telling this parable to, they were trying to seize Him. They were trying to grab Him. and But they were afraid because there were so many people around Him that they couldn't get Him. And so... They also had the insight that this parable was about them. And he spoke that parable against them, which he did. And they left him and went away. So they're going to come back later. But the fourth thing we see is that the rejection that happens here leads to the opening of a new way for a whole new building. It leads to the opening of a new way for new leaders to come in and take care of God's people. And that is the key of this scripture, that Jesus was a, was a stone that could have been used to, found, to be the founding block for a building, but they rejected it, so it's the founding block of a new building. And I think it made me think of when, they, when there's like a new president upstairs and like... They have all their secretaries in that, and then when they leave, they all go with them, don't they, kind of? Sometimes. Okay. And so, this is what happens, like, in this case. Israel is going to face certain judgment because 
of the way that the leaders treated the Messiah. And what happens is God is going to give his, his people into the hands of new leaders, the church, new apostles, Peter, James, John, all those guys. They're going to be the ones that will be the new vine growers. And they'll be faithful because they're already being faithful in what they're doing. And so Israel's religious leadership was supposed to cultivate obedience to God from the people, but instead they looked at it in the sense of taking over and using it for power and end up being cursed and judged, just like the fig tree. So Jesus goes on, and this is the section in Mark where he starts telling a lot of parables, and he's going to be tested by three different groups of the leadership. The Pharisees and the Herodians are going to test him. The Sadducees are going to test him. The Sadducees uh, being very significant in the political life of Israel. And the scribes are going to test him, trying to trip him up in something he could say so that they could kind of have an outwardly legitimate reason for killing him, arresting him and getting him killed by the, gen- by the Romans. And so I think it's an, this is good because sometimes we see, you know, leaders and they fall. They fall into moral failure. Um, but they can get back up. You know, maybe they need a time to be restored and so forth. And this is a little bit different. This is where the leaders are rejecting what God is saying. And we see some of that too. We see leadership that is way off course. We see leadership that is focused on false doctrine or false teaching, leading God's people astray. And this passage applies to them. But it challenges us probably to think of how we can keep cultivating for our own self righteousness for God, even when maybe our leaders, maybe your church leader is not going in the right path in some areas. Don't let, don't let that responsibility fall on him to produce the righteousness. You can still produce your own fruit pleasing to God. Amen. Anybody have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, why, why did God send Jesus, you know, when, when the prophets were just, when all the prophets were going to just be checked time and time again? You know, it brought, it brought to mind, Pharaoh, so.